You're welcome at grace. Find love at grace. Spread peace at grace. Find joy at grace. Said you're welcome here. All our welcomes here. We welcome you to Grace Congregation. To God be the glory for the things he has done and continues to do. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Merciful God, on this third Sunday after Pentecost, we are grateful for this day. We are grateful for the ability to discern. We are grateful for the gift of choice, for the opportunities offered, for the lessons learned, for the people you place in our lives, for the challenges you place before us that make us strong and keep us resilient. For all of this and so much more, we simply say, thank you, Father God. In this month of June, we lift up and celebrate the fathers and grandfathers, the father figures and those male role models who protected us, who guided us, who secured our future. Thank you, God, for their presence in our lives. Thank you for their strength, their courage, and their wisdom. Fathers are blessings from above. Daddies are gifts from God. And this morning, we celebrate those with us and lovingly remember those who sit with you in glory. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the faithful flock here at Grace. Order our steps as we move through this yet unfolding season of change and transition. Keep us steadfast in our stewardship. Gird us up so that our partnerships and connections within our community remain strong and unbroken. Bless us in our work to promote social justice and allow those efforts to thrive and flourish here at Grace. Thank you, merciful God, for bringing us safely to the other side of this pandemic. You kept us strong. You kept us resilient. You kept us persevering. You allowed good health to prevail, and this morning we simply say, thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, hear the prayers and the personal meditations of your people. Open our hearts that we might better feel you and know your glory and your magnificence. Lift our arms that we might embrace and share your loving spirit. Open our mouths that we might glorify your name. In the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, Grace Congregational Church of Harlem. In there, out there, and around the world, welcome, welcome, welcome on this beautiful Sunday morning we have gathered in this house and around the world. So welcome to you. It's a special Sunday, as every Sunday is special, and I look forward to the day we can actually pass the peace once again and see each other and hug on each other. We look forward to those times again. But one disappointing news I heard was that less than 22% of black folks in New York City have gotten vaccinated. And so I encourage you to get the shot because it's so important that we be able to protect each other and we know that there's variants and all kinds of things still happening. Coronavirus has not left us yet and we still have to be vigilant. So be vigilant and do what you can to protect you and your family in these important times. There is a big shout out to Deacon Deborah Jackson, who is already in the Grandma Club, but she's added one more new member to her tribe, Ogenero Elijah Wayne, and that's Roro for short. So we want to say congratulations to her daughter, Imani, and the beautiful family and all that's going on there, and God bless you, God bless you. There is a Women's of Grace meeting today after church at 1230, so those of Women of Grace join us. 
And next Sunday is Father's Day, and we certainly celebrate dads and, of course, our Father who art in heaven. And we thank God for the Father we have and for the Father that we've been given on the earthly Father. And next week we have a special guest preacher, the Reverend Dr. Michael Boss, who comes from the Great Marble Collegiate on Fifth Avenue. So we look forward to hearing a message from the Reverend Dr. Michael Boss next week. And lastly, we pray for all the gun violence. So the, it's disheartening when you hear of kids 10 years old being killed on the streets of New York City. And so we pray that the violence and the gun violence that occurs and so much life is lost, precious life, we pray that this may come to an end and we may find ways to relate to one another as brothers and sisters. For if our Father is our Father in heaven, then we are truly brothers and sisters. Amen. so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, Amen, amen, amen. We have been in a series called Dancing with My Father Again. And this morning I bring you to the dangerous dance. The dangerous dance. The one that has plagued the church for a long time. This indictment is not against Grace Church or against 
the church people, but it's against the religiosity that has set in and kept the church from being the church that it can be. And we have all seen preceding the 1700s, the Great Awakening, the 1800s with the Great Reformation, and then the 1900s with Azuzu Street, that before every revelation and every revival in the church, what we have seen is a getting back to the true message of the church. What we have seen is people getting back to the relevancy of church again. And I wish to start that here and now by talking about this text this morning because it is at the core of Jesus' message. And so this morning I bring you to Luke 15, verses 25 to 32. Luke 15, verses 25 to 32. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what was going on? Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you have killed the fattened calf for him. My son, the father says, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father God, Mother God, Holy Spirit, we bombard the heavens with our prayers and with our faith so that you may let your prayers, your faith, your love, your hope it fill us right now, O Lord God. Let us hear, thus saith the Lord, so we may hear what may transform us and renew our mind and renew our strength and give us the hope and the courage to love in this world dangerously as you did. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. I want to bring you to another painting which was done by Rembrandt in the 1700s. It is called The Return of the Prodigal Son. And it is said to talk about Rembrandt's life, who started out arrogant, who started out with all kinds of hopes and dreams and thought he could just take on the world. And this is towards the end of his life when he is 62 in one of his last paintings. And it is him returning in tattered clothing and with no shoes on and back to God. This is his story. He found himself in the prodigal son's story. The father welcoming the son home. The son having nothing but tattered and, and broken shoes but the only thing that remains, and you may not be able to see it, but he has his sword on his belt. He had something to remind him that he was the father's son. Something that kept him connected, that he could go home at any time. And it says, the Bible says, when he came to himself. But also you will see the welcoming father, the kiss of the father when he came home. He didn't say a word to him, he just kissed him and showed him compassion and welcomed him home. But I want to talk to you today about the elder brother. The elder brother who is to the right. It is said because he has the red on, like the father, that he was also of no nobility and he was also of royalty. But he looks down upon the father and upon his brother with disdain as his hands are clasped and folded. How could you welcome this one home, your son. He doesn't even call him brother. And so Rembrandt, who went through much tragedy in his life, lost five children, 
His wife passed away before him, preceded him, and he saw much tragedy in his life. He had to lose everything in debtor's court and pretty much died broken and tattered, but knowing that he could return to God was what he saw in his last, one of his last pictures Rembrandt painted. And so this morning I bring you the elder brother. The elder brother. We much talk about the younger brother being lost, for he left home and was lost. But the younger brother who stayed home was also lost. And we must talk about that this morning because we understand that the young man who left the house took his inheritance, what a shame he must have brought upon the family and how angry the elder brother must have been at the father and the son for what had happened. But I want to talk to you this morning about the dangerous dance that we all participate in as the elder son. As the elder son, we participate in this dance. And so nothing keeps us further away from God than our own goodness. Nothing keeps us further away than our own goodness. Let me read to you the text. The text says, the older brother became angry and refused to go in the house. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I have been slaving for you and you never, and I never disobeyed your orders. I never disobeyed your orders. Henry Nguyen picked this up in a book called Return of the Prodigal Son. And he said not only did the younger son need to return home, but the older son needed to go home as well. You can stay home and be lost. You can stay home. You don't have to leave home to be lost. Amen. And so this morning, we want to make sure, because what Jesus is charging, if you remember at the beginning of this text and the book chapter 15 of Luke, the Pharisees is charging Jesus with having dinners with, with those who are sinners, having dinner with the tax collector, having dinner with those outcasts, and calling them friends. And so at the beginning of this, Jesus is charged, and Jesus responds with three lost things. He responds with the sheep that has been lost, he responds with the coin that has been lost, and he responds with the sons that have been lost. Not only was the younger son lost, but also the elder son was lost. And this is important because as the church has strayed away from the message of God, as the church has strayed away from the heart of God, as the church has strayed away from the Father of God, Father, this is the problem. And so this is what the church must get back to. You can believe you are with God and still be far away from God. That is a challenge this morning because the father says to the elder son, my son, you have always been with me and all that I have is yours. He re repeats that. And so Jesus is saying constantly, you may be with me, but you still don't know me. How many people have been with people and they still don't know you? They can live with you, spend time with you, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and they still don't know you. Jesus has brought this point up when speaking to, his, to Philip, Philip who knew him well. He said, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And so in John 14, 9, Jesus charges Philip, you've been with me a long time. You know who I am. And if you know me, you know the Father. You don't need me to show you the Father because if you're looking at me, you can see the reflection of the Father in me. But I think the, one of the greatest indictments that church folks can get is what Matthew 7, 22 to 23. Many will say to me on that judgment day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. 
How is it that church folks who can do things in the mighty name of Jesus, prophesy miracles in the mighty name of Jesus, we can do all those things, and yet at the end of the day, we still don't know Jesus. Jesus will say, I don't know you. I don't know who you are. How is this possible that we can be so separated from God and yet still doing God's work? We must be, we could be like the elder son, involved in the father's business, involved in the father's issues, involved with the father, still living at home, and yet we don't know the father. This is the charge of the church today. Because the elder brother who doesn't, who is there, does not know the father doesn't understand the kindness, doesn't understand the loving dad who has taken care of them well and taken care of them and protected them. And when he sees what he has done for the younger son, he should have said, I know my father. I may not understand it. I may be angry, but guess what? I know who my father is, and I know the kindness that my father has. I know the compassion that my father has. And so when you can see that, you know the father, and you know, even though it goes against what you believe or you think should be done, you know it is being done with compassion and with love. And so the second thing that we understand this morning is that the elder brother is more lost than the younger son. I know you're saying to me, how can you be more lost? You're either lost or you're not lost. I remember Billy Crystal, they were riding somewhere, and one person asked, do you know where we're going? And he says, no, but we're making good time. So sometimes you can be lost, but sometimes you can be more lost, meaning that you don't even know you're lost. The worst thing is, one thing you know you're lost and you need to find your way back home, like the young son, but the elder son was lost and he didn't even know that he was lost. That is more loss because you don't even know. You don't even know what you have to fix. You don't even know what you have to do because the elder brother, not in spite of his goodness, but because of his goodness, he was lost. This is why it's a charge against the church. This is why it's a charge against the Pharisee and the church people and all those religiosities because why isn't the elder son going into the house? Why isn't the elder son celebrating that his younger son, his younger brother has come home? Why isn't he celebrating? Why isn't he understanding? Because he is saying, I have obeyed you, Father. I've done all the good things. I've done all the right things. Therefore, you ought to be able to celebrate me, and why are you celebrating my brother? He doesn't get it. He doesn't understand and this is the charge. It is the, one of the things that you can go on for years and decades before the church recognizes that we have been separated from God. We have been preaching the message of God. We have been talking and doing works in God, but we are separated from the heart of God. And whenever we get separated from the heart of God, we must do something to get back to the heart of God. And that's where we must be this morning. And that's why they're charging Jesus with dining with the sinners, dining with the tax collector, dining with all those outcasts. How could you possibly do that, Jesus? And Jesus is showing them that the real people that are lost are not the ones who are doing all that and, and, and shouldn't be dined with as they think, but the ones who think they're in the church, they're in the synagogue, they're in the temple. These are the ones that are truly lost. And this is what Jesus is charging them with. Because the thing that really separates us from God, let me tell you this morning, John Gerstner wrote this, the thing that really separates us from God is not so much our sins, but our damnable good works. Our damnable good works. I've always heard and sometimes said in church, it's not the devils on the outside that are the issue, it's the pretentious angels on the inside that cause all the problems because it's us pretending like we're Christian. It's us acting like we're Christians, and we give Christianity a bad name. Because it's all in those things. People see, through us, they see a glimpse of Jesus. Through us, they see a glimpse of the Father. And I must say this morning, what are they seeing? What are they seeing this morning? And Jesus wants to make sure that the church people get it right. Because if the church people don't get it right, then nobody gets it right, because then everybody's lost. 
We need to be found again. We need to get back to the core message again. And so number one, let's talk about our goodness and how our goodness gets in the way. Because when our badness happens, we know what to fix. But when our goodness happens, we're not sure what needs to be fixed. So number one, goodness masks our battle with sin. Goodness masks our battle with sin. Our goodness becomes our own Lord and our own Savior. We no longer trust in God. We no longer lead God because we're good. We're good. I don't need God. I'm good. All those other people need God. All those other people need to repent. I'm good. And so we rest in that. And when things fall apart for the elder brother, when things don't work out, he doesn't know what to do. At least the younger brother, when things fell apart, he knew that he had to come to his senses and he had to get back home to the father where he said, even the servants in my father's house live better than I am right now in a pigsty, in a mud pen. But guess what? The elder brother doesn't understand. He is lost too. And he says this, he says this, look at all the years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you have never given me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. And that's why goodness gets in the way of our relationship with the Father, because we think that because we're good, we are owed all the kinds of things. And then when life stops working, when things start falling apart, we don't really know. We know there's smoke, but we don't know where the fire is. We don't know what to fix. We think, well, we've been good. Why is this happening to me? I've talked to people, and they said, well, I tried Christianity, and it really didn't work. You know what they're saying? I asked God for something, and he didn't give it to me. Therefore, God doesn't work. That's what it means. And that's why we have to get back to the core message of loving and wanting and understanding who God truly is. Because then we wouldn't say those kinds of things. We wouldn't replace God with our goodness. We would replace God with the only thing that can replace God is God. That's the only thing. And so the second thing is we be, we, our goodness becomes a weapon. We weaponize our goodness because the good, the good, the good son says, I've been a good son. I've listened to you. I've obeyed you. I've slaved for you in the field. I didn't leave home. I didn't take my inheritance. I've been here. And so he weaponizes his goodness. I, I'm owed a goat. I'm owed something. I'm owed whatever it is because I've been good. And this is what we have to work on. Our sense that because of the loving spirit of our Father, we must know that whatever our Father hands down, is only goodness for us, that our goodness could never trump what the goodness that our Father who gives us. And so this morning, I want you to understand that the brother did not understand that his goodness was getting in the way of his relationship with his father. He thought because he was doing everything right, that he was the right son, he was the good son, that he should have everything given to him, bestowed upon him, rather than recognizing that he's a son, that everything was going to be given to him. The elder son gets two-thirds of the estate. He should have understood. He, the father says, you've been with me, and all that I have is already yours. We weaponize our goodness. When we help the poor, when we help the needy, we say, well, I've been good, therefore all the good things in life should happen to me. And then when bad things happen, we don't know how to handle it. We don't know what to do with it because we're sitting there saying, I've been good. I've been good. And how could this happen to me? And that's a very dangerous dance. That's a dance that you're saying, I'm doing this just to obligate God to do what I want to do in the future. And that's a dangerous dance that we can have with God. My good deeds, my moral uh, rectitude, my caring for the needy, my taking care of the hungry, my taking care of family, it's also that you are in debt to me and you owe me and so I have weaponized my goodness instead of just giving it, instead of just saying here's a gift because it's been a gift from God to give me life and to give me all that I have and I wish to bless you with it and you owe me nothing in return. That is when we stop weaponizing our goodness. 
In The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis talks about the fictional bus that goes from hell to, to heaven, and you, you're going to be surprised at the people who are in heaven and the people who are in hell. And all the people that you thought should be in hell may be in heaven because they knew they needed a Savior and they knew they needed a Lord. But the ones that were in hell who were doing good and went up to heaven and said, what are these murderous people doing here? What are these people doing here? And they thought, I've been good. Why am I not in heaven? And that's the great divorce. When we think we're owed heaven because we've done all these good works. We've done them in the name of Jesus, and we've cried, Lord, Lord. But God's going to say one day, I don't know you. Who are you? Because you weren't connected to the Father's heart. This morning, we want to make sure that we're connected to the Father's heart because that's a dangerous dance when we're not connected and we're doing all these works in God's name, but we're not connected to God. And the elder brother was doing all these works, but he really didn't have a relationship with the Father. That's what, we're dis what's what Jesus is pointing at this morning. And the third thing that is, that our good works take us further and further away from God. I know that when we become a Christian, we confess our sins and we repent of our sins, which means to turn around 180 degrees and go the other way. But the truth is we also need to repent of our good works because some of our good works have been keeping us from God because we think that because we have good works that we are owed to be with God. And that doesn't what gives us what God is. It, what gives us to be with God is the grace that he has bestowed upon us. And so when we understand it's not our goodness, our goodness can keep us and get us further and further away. I've been a good child. I've been a good son. I remember when I was looking for a car and my father and I said, let's go out and, and buy a car. And I looked out in the lot and I saw this powder blue Mustang. It was $2,200. And I said, Dad, that's my car. I've been a good son. I have worked dutifully for you. And he said, son, how much money do you have? I said, $800. He said, you see that Toyota Corolla for $700? That's your car. And so we have to remember this morning that just because we've worked hard, we are still loved, but we're not owed anything. We're not owed anything. And so even though the elder brother was lost, he was harder to find because he didn't know he was lost. See, when you're in a pigsty, in a mud pen, you know you're lost. <laughs> when you've been partying hardy, you took all your daddy's money, and you ain't got no money left, and you're in tattered clothing, you realize, I am lost. But when you're still at home, still well clothed, still well fed, still taken care of, and yet you're still thinking, I'm a good son, you could be lost and more lost than the son who left home. And that's what Jesus is driving at this morning. And how do we know that he's lost? How do we know he's lost? Here's a few signs that you are dangerously dancing. Amen? Here's a few signs this morning that you are dangerously dancing on the precipice of destruction. Here it is. Number one, the son was very angry. Very, very angry about what he was getting and what his younger brother, who he didn't believe deserved what he was getting. And so the elder brother who said, I never got a, even a young goat, and you would therefore kill a fattened calf? We understand that goats were cheap and calf were expensive. And so therefore he's asking, you didn't even do the littlest, the least you could have done. I'm a better person. I deserve more. I deserve more than so-and-so. I know how so-and-so is living, and I know they should not be getting any blessings from heaven. That's when you know you're on a dangerous dance. You are doing a dangerous dance when you do that because you are comparing yourself to somebody else. And yet the Father says, you have been with me. You have been in the house. You have been here enjoying the luxuries of being in home and being in the company of a loving Father. And you feel that has not been enough. You want something else. And that's what we understand this morning, that there ought to be a red alert going off anytime you start comparing your life to somebody else. Because what are you comparing it for? And what are you comparing it with? Because what God has given you, you could never, ever repay. And you are still in God's love. You could, and I said, I believe two weeks ago, 
God couldn't love you any more than he loves you right now. But guess what? You can't do anything to make God love you any less than he loves you right now. And this morning, we rest in that grace. Because when we're looking around and looking to see, look at what so-and-so got, look at what they got, we are losing our sense of who we really are, our inherent dignity of who God created us to be. And when we realize who we are and what we are, then it won't truly matter what anybody else gets. That's important this morning that you get that. Because number two, you have a low sense of self-esteem because you don't realize your value. The older, brother, the older brother thought, I'm good, therefore I'm valuable, because if I'm sinful, I'm worthless. But that's not the gospel. What the gospel says, it acknowledges that we are sinful creatures, but it also says you're absolutely valuable to the God and the God heaven. You are still valuable. No matter what you've done, no matter how many pig pens you've been in, no matter how many mud holes you've laid down, face down in, you are still valuable to God. And so this morning, we are both sinful, and yet we are absolutely valuable to God. And this is important, because when things go wrong, when things fall apart, you won't be saying, is the Father judging me? Is this judgment? No, this is just life going wrong, and yet you are still loved. When you know that you have not done the right thing, you won't just beat up on yourself. You know that you are still loved by the Father, and therefore there is an inherent dignity that you carry with you, and so low esteem will not be won, and you will not be worried about what your brother or your sister has, because what you have is priceless. What you have, you could never trade for anything else in this world. And so you know, hey, I'm sinful, but guess what? I'm absolutely loved. I'm absolutely valuable to the heaven, and I know why. I'm here. God created me, gave me life, and therefore he believes there is something in me that is important. And so when bad things happen, I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining because I know all the good things that God has done for me. Amen? But the last thing is hating the law. You can see in the sense of his expression of the elder son I have been slaving for you. Now, somebody who's a son, somebody who's working in the family business doesn't say, I've been slaving, because that's not a slave. And the younger brother acknowledges that the servants of the house are living better than he is on the outside of the house. So the elder son has not understood yet what he has. He says, I've been following orders. I've been doing all that you asked me to do, and I've been slaving all for you. See, this is where we are on a dangerous dance because what matters is not always what we do, but why we do it. The motivation behind something makes all the difference in the world. I'm reminded of two bricklayers, and when one guy came by and he was interviewing them, and he asked one, what are you doing? And he said, I'm just laying bricks. And he said to the second one, what are you doing? And he says, I am building the greatest cathedral in the world. I want to say to you, those bricks would be laid very differently. Because it matters, your motivation for doing things. If you're just following the law because it's the right thing to do, it's a good thing to do, but you will feel like a slave, you will feel like you're in bondage, I can only do this, I can't do that. But when you realize what the psalmists have come to sing, what the psalmists have said, but those who delight in the law of the Lord and who meditate on God's law day and night. The psalmist is singing, those who delight in the law, because when you realize the Father set these precepts so that we could be happy, so that we could be in the fullness of our joy. You are reading your Bible. You are, you are praying to God because it's out of joy. It's out of happiness because you know what a God has done for you and you know what a God is doing for you and therefore you delight in the law of the Lord. You don't feel like a slave. You don't feel like somebody who is serving a master. You feel like I am a son or a daughter. I am a child of the living king. And that is the difference when the psalmist sings, but those who delight in the law of the Lord. And then in Psalm 119, with my lips I declare all the ordinances of your mouth. I delight in the way of your decree as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts. 
Who delights in the way of someone's decrees? Who delights in that? As I delight in riches. Can you imagine that? Basking in some decrees as you bask in the riches of life. Because once you understand it comes from the fountain of love, it comes from a great place, you understand, it is, and further it goes, it is as sweet as honey. That's what the law becomes. That's what the Bible becomes to you because you have been in the presence of a loving father. You have a relationship with a loving father. Do you see when the elder brother says, I have slave for you, that there isn't a relationship there? That there isn't a bond there, that he could find joy and happiness being with the Father in the Father's house. He can't see the joy. He can't even, he, they, the Bible says there was dancing and music. He can't enter the party. He can't go there because guess what? He is so angry. He is upset with the Father. He's upset with the Son. And he can't even imagine, he can even party with the family because he doesn't get it. He doesn't see it. And so this morning, you understand God's not just looking for worshipers. God's not just looking for servants. God is looking for children who will be his child, who he can bask and love and take care of and look at and look for. Because you know why? God found something beautiful in you. God found something beautiful in you. He's not looking for you just to worship him. He's not just looking for you to praise him. He knows something about you that made him say, you are beautiful. It's something in him said, I'm willing to go to the cross for you because of all you've done and all that you are. When you have that kind of love, when you have somebody that loves you that kind of way, you understand that you, we need to fall, and Revelation says, Fall back in love with your first love. Your first love was God. Your first love was God who created you and crafted you and molded you out of love. And so the ultimate beauty, the ultimate thing in our life is the heart of God. It says render not your garment but your heart because the only thing you can give to God is your heart this morning. If we can just give our heart this morning and this morning so that we can say, I, you, you wouldn't say, I slave for you. You wouldn't say that because you would show, no, Daddy, I have been in your house, and I'm thankful and grateful that I've been your son, and I'm grateful that our, our he doesn't even call his brother his brother. He says, your son, who went out prostituting and doing all kinds of craziness, has now come home. When you have the right heart, when you have love in your heart, You'll have the assurance. And you'll, you'll know that even though you didn't get a goat, <laughs> a young goat, and the thing is, when you kill a fattened calf, that is to feed the whole village. The father is preparing to party with the whole village and to celebrate with the whole village. When the, when the elder son says, you haven't given me a goat just so that I could party with my friends, but the father wants to celebrate with the whole village and let the joy be spread throughout. And so when our brothers and when our sisters go wayward, we ought to be the ones that are looking for them because this is the chapter of lost things, right? The lost coin and the lost sheep and the lost sons. But we got to remember we were once lost and are now found. That we were once lost. We weren't always in church. We weren't always in the loving embrace of God. We didn't always feel that way. And now we, when we recognize that, we recognize that there's grace upon our lives, that we can go out and stop being judgmental on other people's lives because we recognize the grace that is on our lives. And so we say to people, will you dance with me? Will you dance with me this morning? We need people who can dance with one another. We need Republicans and Democrats to learn to dance together again. We need conservatives and liberals to dance together again. We need straight folks and gay folks to dance together again. 
because we've got to find a way to get back to the core message, which is we are God's children, and therefore we are all connected. And we can't be judgmental of other people because of the way they live or what they're doing. We know that there is grace upon our lives, and there ought to be grace given to them because of the grace that was extended to us this morning. And so we want to dance with our brothers. We want to dance with our sisters again. And I want you to understand this morning that we celebrate one another. We celebrate you because you are a spark of God. You are a spark of glory. And because of that, we want to say we love you and we want to eat with you. And we want to dine with you. There isn't anybody that we shouldn't dine with or anyone we shouldn't eat with because I know today that families are divided because of the Republican and Democrat. They can't even talk to each other. They can't even communicate with each other anymore. But this morning, Jesus is eating with the sinners. Jesus is eating with all the outcasts and having di dined with them and showing the Pharisee that they are more lost than the people who they think are lost because they don't even know they're lost. This morning, I hope you hear that you understand that Jesus didn't think it robbery to go and sit with those people and to be dancing with those people. We ought to learn to dance with those people again. And so this morning, we ought to have people dancing because we were lost. I want to give you a story that illustrates what I'm talking about. Lieutenant James Patterson on the left and his brother George Patterson on the right. James Patterson was a air pilot for the Air Force. His plane went down behind enemy lines in Vietnam. It is said there are over a thousand families who still don't know where the body, they still don't have a grave site, they still don't know what happened to their family member. But George didn't stop there. He went looking for his brother. For over 48 years, he went behind enemy lines. He went all over the world trying to find what happened to his brother. Because remember, when Jesus is teaching about lost things, the shepherd went out to get back the sheep. The woman in the house swept the house to find that precious coin. But the last thing that happened, that the father went out to greet the young son. He also went out to greet the elder son to bring him into the house who stayed out. And so we have a failure, for the brother here shows us what our elder brother did, that our elder brother, who was sitting in royalty next to the father, said, I'll take off my robe. I will take off my rings. I will lay down my scepter. I will put down my crown, and I will come and I will seek, and I will find, and I'll get back my brothers and sisters who have been lost. Don't do the dangerous dance that keeps you away from God. Don't do the dangerous dance that keeps you from your brother and sister. It's time that we get back to dancing with our Father again. Amen.
Father God, we come to you at this moment with gratitude in our hearts for all that you have done for us. And how can we repay you when you have given us everything and sacrificed all for us? And so, Lord God, it is only with a heart of thanksgiving that we give back to you. And so, God bless you. God bless you in your giving. Amen. Just want to praise you forever and ever and ever. Thank you, 
Father God, we lift these gifts to you. No other help we know. We thank you for providing a place called home, a place we could always run to, a place we can always go back to and know that your loving arms would be there to receive us. Oh, Father God, let us prepare our hearts so that we may be your sons and your daughters. Use these gifts mightily, Lord, so that we may spread the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. May the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the sweetest communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide in every household of faith now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Grace Church said, Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>